So, so you guys, you know, you have these awesome churches. That they're, we're all different in numerical size. Our churches are. We're all different denominationally. You were former Methodist, now non-denominational. You guys chose to step out of that. But what unites us pastorally and even the mission of our churches, let's talk about that benefit for just a moment. We are all united around the authority and sufficiency of Scripture, God's holy word. It is authoritative. It is sufficient. And welcome once again to another edition of Footnotes. Pastor Mark here, and today, oh goodness, this is unorthodox, or is it? I'm not joined with our pastors. I'm joined instead with two other pastors from two other denominations. This sounds like a really bad joke. A Baptist, a Presbyterian, and a non-denominational pastor walk into a bar. And then what happens, guys? What do you think? What was our answer? They form a committee. Yes, they form a committee. (laughs) To decide whether or not they should be there. There you go. That's right. And what are they doing there and all that good stuff. Well, today I'm so excited and privileged to be joined with two of my friends. I call you friends. I've known, uh, let's go to you because we've known each other the longest. Mike Weinbrenner, pastor of Christ Fellowship Church, PCA in Horn Lake, Mississippi, but I've known you, Mike, uh, since you were at Christ uh, Covenant. Christ Pres. Pres, yep. just Christ Pres. I get so confused. You you Presbyterians. We use a lot of the wordy. same, the same three words in all of our churches. All of your right. churches. So just say Covenant something and you got it right. Anyway, Mike and I, we've known each other for, gosh, what, 25 uh, years? Probably, yeah, close to that. Yeah, when I was teaching at SBEC, Mike was a youth pastor. A lot of his kids were in the classes I was teaching. We became friends and just fellowshiped together. Yeah, you chaperoned some trips for me. Sure did. We went to, what was that called? Uh, the uh, Laguna Beach Christian Retreat Center. And what did what did the Presbyterians call that camp? Oh, uh, RYM, Reformed Youth. That's Movement. right, RYM. Yeah. yeah, I took Amanda, my yep. wife. Yeah, we were just getting started. And, uh, I, you know, believe it or not, I kept the notes from that. Oh, cool. camp and i found them the other day in a box and i thought well look at here that's from that rym camp was that joe novenson's year no that was a guy who sailed on a sailboat and had a three at the end of his name john mark yates the third or something like that yeah i don't remember you don't remember i'll look it up but it was really good it was good he did a good job okay and then to my left here on the microphone my friend now for four years Mm -hmm. since I've moved back to the Memphis area. Jonathan Wallace, pastor at Get Well Church. It's not Get Well Road. Right. It's just Get Well Church. Right. Yes. And Jonathan, you have just been a tremendous blessing and friend to me over the last four years. We work together in the concession stand now. That's a lot of fun. And we talk the whole time. Mm -hmm. And they say, we need more fries. Right. You guys are talking too much. Well, you get two pastor preachers together and you, that's just going to happen. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm, I'm perfecting Jonathan, Mike, on how to make the best French fries. So now yeah. now I'm training my Padawan in the art of French fry. And they're, people right. are telling me they're, they're as good or better. Uh, all I've heard is that they're the best ever and there's only <laughs> one thing that's changed. So It's you. Yeah. That's right. So the three of us, we're all three obviously in different denominations. I'm Baptist, you're Presbyterian, you're non-denominational. We all three serve in this community. We have uh, friends that go to each other's churches. And people might look at that and some would be elated. Oh, I'm so glad that you pastors can sit down and talk with one another and have a friendship. Other people would say, well, I mean, you've obviously become a liberal because you're associating with that Presbyterian and that non-denominationalist and about you, they'd say, wow, you know, what are you doing for that Baptist? You know, secretly buying something for him at the store? No, you know, or, <laughs> or whatever. What are, you, what are you doing with him? And so there, there's, um, there's kind of joy from some people when they realize we have this relationship. And then there's maybe trepidation from other people when they realize we have this relationship. 
but we are all brothers in Christ and we're friends and we're going to continue that friendship with some neat things. We're all going to Washington together with our kids coming up in a few weeks. And That's right. We're going to get to know each other. I'm rooming with you, Mike. That's yes. So, <laughs> you know, I was going to room with you, Jonathan, but, you know, Mike drew the bad end of that stick. <laughs> so, so here we are, friends, and we want to talk about our friendship and our connection. And what we hope to do is encourage the listeners that this friendship and connection has benefits. And the benefits could be classified in these three ways, all alliterated, Mike, because I'm a Baptist. All right, ready? So first of all, we just want to talk about the benefit of our personal connection together as friends and pastors. And we're going to you know, look at that from different angles. How does it benefit us? How does it benefit our calling, our ministry, personally speaking? Give the listener some insight into the pastor's world. But then we want to go out from there, and we want to say, now, how does that friendship personally benefit our local church? Our local churches may not realize the benefit they're getting from our relationship, but they do receive it in multiple ways, so we'll give them some insight there. And then finally, how that benefits our community. We go even further out. We say, okay, in a post-Christian world, it's good that we come together and how is the community benefited from our connection? So connection, and then connection to the churches, and then connection to the community. So let's talk about those benefits, all right? Let's jump right in. Number one, personal connection. How is that beneficial for us as pastors to have a personal connection with one another? You know, I always think about the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 10. He said, do not neglect meeting with one another as some are in the habit of doing, but continue to meet and spur one another on. And I think as pastors, we have unique challenges, unique responsibilities, unique difficulties, uh, and a weight that really a, another pastor is really the only other person who can understand the unique weight that we carry. And I don't know about you guys, but I need to be spurred on mm -hmm. to keep doing the faithful work that God's put before me, because there are lots of days where you wake up and you you wonder, do I have it today? Do I have it this week? Um, we get hurt just like other people, but we're supposed to act like that doesn't happen. Uh, we carry the the weight and the burdens of our people, and uh, we it's hard to know how to share that or when or should you share that with others. And and sometimes you just need to be reminded, I'm not crazy. I'm not alone. I'm still called to do this and, and spur one another on to this thing that God's called us to do. Uh, absolutely. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that um, it's important to have friendships uh, outside of our ministry community. I have a lot of mentors and, and good friendships inside my, my denominational community. Um, but there is some safety uh, in being able to share some things that are, you know, maybe a little more sensitive uh, with people that are outside of that context. Uh, each of us are aware of men who have either sinned out or burned out of ministry um, in the last, you know, 10, 10 15 years. And so we uh, want to learn how to be resilient, how to protect ourselves from those uh, possibilities. Yeah. 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 There, and there's another unique dynamic here in that you guys understand we wear a lot of hats. Uh, one day or one moment you're you're a boss, another moment you're a pastor, another moment you're a counselor, uh, another moment you are a friend, and it can be really difficult to navigate that with people that we do life with day in and day out in our churches, and so it's really helpful to have somebody where the relationship is more clearly defined that you are a friend. And, and you're an advocate. I don't have to wonder what hat I'm wearing at this moment. We can just be friends with one another. I think every pastor understands this dynamic of walking into a room and it going silent because of that just different relationship we have with people. And to be able to walk into a room with one of you guys and know that we know and understand each other and we're just friends when we're here to encourage and and help each other and challenge each other when it's appropriate it's just a healthy beneficial uplifting 
relationship that I think every pastor should have. Mm-hmm. You you said something, Jonathan, when we were talking before we recorded, that pastors often feel that everyone wants something mm-hmm. from them, and both of you are shaking your head. Yeah. So you're agreeing with that statement. I can't agree more. And that's not an indictment on our people. We're there to shepherd them and love them and serve them. So I don't I don't want to make them feel guilty, but what people don't understand is is we we do. We walk into the room, you know, we're not invited into certain circles because it would it would be weird to have your pastor there, <laughs> you know. Uh, so you feel somewhat, somewhat isolated. And then when you do go out to lunch with somebody, I'm always waiting for it. Okay, what do they want? Mm-hmm. You know, what do they want? They want to know something. They want to ask something. And again, that, that sounds a bit too cynical. But you are the leader. You are the shepherd. That's the burden and responsibility of leadership that you bear. I don't know. Do you guys feel that way? I mean, I know you said yeah. it before the podcast, and you talked about the many hats. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's something people don't often understand. We do. We're a counselor. We're a speaker. Um, you know, we're a leader of our staff. We, we have to provide direction, you know. And then sometimes we have to play politician. I mean, especially, you know, in the roles um that we navigate and, and people don't realize all these different hats. And that's why a lot of guys, you know, you talked about guys haven't been faithful. Mike, you mentioned we've all known guys that didn't make it. A lot of guys just say, you know what? This is just too much emotionally. I can go get a job and just do my nine to five or whatever and clock out. And I don't have to wear 25 hats and try to figure out how to solve all these constant problems. Right. Right. And I don't think anybody needs to throw us a pity party, and, and yeah, we're not right. judging anyone. Uh, most of us, we answer this calling with some sense of awareness of what we're being called into. That doesn't mean, though, that there's not a weight and a heaviness to it and a, a challenge to it to where we don't benefit from a relationship, whether we're not either. And it's not always that that it's reality. Sometimes it's just our perception that, people want things or need things from us because of the role that we're called to play. But it's constantly that dynamic is there and it's so healthy for us to have a relationship where there's no idea or concept or expectation that you're asking something of me or that I need to take on this this mantle of serving you in some specific way other than a friendship. That's so very healthy for us to remember. And so don't I don't want people to think that we're upset or cynical or, or be feel bad for us, but we do need to be aware of that dynamic. I, I was just thinking the same thing. I'm so glad you said that. And I think one way to think about it is so often we're telling our people to take up the means of grace, to, you know, to, to take up the resources that God has provided them in their walk of faith and in their relationships. And sometimes we forget that we need those things as well. And we need, um, safe places to be ourselves and be poured into, not just to pour out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we have this this connection, the three of us. Yeah. We're developing that friendship every day, daily, in mm-hmm. some respect or aspect. Um, as pastors, we've already talked about that benefits us because we have these relationships where we don't have to worry about what's the need and what's the hat. Um what else personally, how would it benefit us personally beyond that? Well, you know, it comes to mind, I mean, we're all dads. And uh, I think one of the connections that we had uh, currently, we had before other other connections, but also just that we have a son, each of us in the same grade, in the same school. And somehow they found each other without even knowing that we were all pastors. <laughs> yes, yes. So yeah. I found out Jude was your son and I found out Leo is yours, and and then I'm like, well, perfect, because that's that's a great point. Families, you know, we sign up for this. Our wife, you know, feels that call to some degree as well with us, but our children, it's it's they're born into it. They don't have a choice. Some of my children have been okay with that. Some have really struggled with the fishbowl, and so it's good 
A, that they have other PKs that they can hang out with, just be real with, right? One of my children says often at school, you know, kids will say, well, you're a pastor's child. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't say that. Now, they're doing it and saying it, whatever it is, but they're holding this child to a higher standard. Our families, you know, need our connection, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Talk about that. How do your kids fare with all that? I thought it was the funniest thing in the world when Jude found his way to Landon and Leo and and built that connection. It's like they have a, a magnet toward one another. But they do have a unique set of circumstances that they did not sign up for. It, living in that fishbowl, the higher expectations. And I think one of the things that we benefit in our relationship and our friendship with each other is simply to remind each other that our first ministry is to our family. Mm-hmm. That our first ministry is to love our wife well, to pursue her, to cherish her, to lead her. And then second is to love and lead our children and to serve that role as a father and to make sure that we're committing to that through what we say to each other, through what we model for one one another, for how we encourage each other to continue to do that. One of the commitments I have is, is I've said yes to follow Jesus in this unique role as equipping the saints for ministry as a pastor is that I never let that come between me and my first calling to pastor my family, to love my family, to lead my family. We've all seen way too many examples of PKs, pastor kids who walk away from the church and walk away from the faith because the father's more committed to the work of ministry than a life of ministry that, that starts in the home. And I think that us being around each other and encouraging each other and modeling for each other is one of the greatest benefits that we could hope for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I agree. And it's interesting if you study church history, some of the most famous pastors and missionaries, you know, who we have all these great works and sermons from were terrible husbands and fathers. And so the older I get, the more my heroes are men that you've never heard of, pastors that you know, made it to retirement, uh, still loving their wives, still loving Jesus, uh, whose kids respect them and honor them. Yes. Someone gave me a book this past year on 25 famous Christian marriages, and most of the marriages in the book, not all, were horrible. I'm trying to remember the person, and if I said his name, and I don't want to malign anyone, but this guy's now gone on. But he was a writer and a preacher, pretty high up there, maybe like a Tozer, maybe like a Packer, somebody like that. And his wife, the relationship was so bad that he would make her walk to church and he would drive. Have you ever heard that story? Anyway, I know that's that's bizarre and you're not the thought maybe it triggers something, but they just had a bad relationship. And when he died she was more thankful (laughs) that that burden was off of her. And yet he was this, you know, renowned, famous, sought after pastor, leader, theologian, but just could not manage his household. Wow. And so it's great that, that our kids are growing up and we're dealing with that and we're, we're dealing with life together and, I appreciate that connection. I think that's what you're saying. We appreciate that connection. Our 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 personnel, personal life, our ministry, our family, we all benefit together. We absolutely have to remember that before we serve as a pastor, that we are followers of Jesus, uh, that we're sons of God, grafted in by the mercy and the grace of God through Jesus Christ and what he's done for us, and that we have these other roles as husbands and fathers. And a lot of times people will get passionate about programs or things that are happening in the church and and they want to give themselves to that, but they're not really giving themselves to Jesus and they're not really committing themselves in their, in their daily walk. 
and th- this may sound a little abrasive, but I think sometimes we we need to kind of uh, challenge one another in, in a little bit of abrasive way as long as it's coming with love. But I'll tell guys all the time, nobody wants to hear about your Jesus if you don't love your wife well. Because the world we live in is watching all the time. And if what we say doesn't match up with what we do and how we live our life, then we've, we've just compromised everything that we're trying to live for. Yeah. Well, that's a good summary of our connection. Let's move it further. Our connection benefits not only the people sitting around this table and our families and our ministry personally, but it benefits our local church. So how does our connection personally benefit our local churches? Now, let me start by just giving our listener who may not be familiar with your church kind of a a sketch of what our churches are like. Broadway, Southern Baptist, um, I don't don't know that I would say we're ultra-traditional. There are certainly ones that are more traditional in style than we are, but that's our background, our history. Then we've got Covenant, yeah, yeah. Christ, Christ, Christ Fellowship, Christ, Christ Covenant, Fellowship, yeah. Covenant Fellowship. Yes, there we go. Uh, we're a ten-year-old church plant, Presbyterian Church in America. There's like twenty-six or so different Presbyterian denominations. Uh, most of them are, are no longer, um, you know, believe in the the sufficiency of Scripture, uh, the inerrancy of Scripture. But we are a, a conservative denomination. And I want to touch on that because people here, Presbyterian Church. America, and that's confusing because there's the PCUSA, Presbyterian Church of, I guess, the United States of America, and they are like extremely liberal. Yes. So the PCUSA, very liberal theologically, the PCA, very conservative. That's right. So, Mike, you know I went to Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis for my doctorate, and that's a PCA uh, seminary. I wanted to study under Brian Chapel, who uh, didn't his sister go to Christ? She still does. Yeah, she goes to our mother church in Olive Branch, and uh, Doc, need... Doctor Chapel is now the the moderator of the PCA. So he's oh well, the, there uh, you the go. Stated clerk, sorry. Okay. PCA. Well, his book Christ Centered Preaching was really huge in my life, and I wanted to like find him and study under him. So I, I went up there for that purpose. Was not uh, disappointed at all. It was a very good experience. Uh, but people hear PCA as a Baptist, and they go, oh, isn't that the liberal? <laughs> no, there's the PCUSA. It's very confusing. It's very confusing. There's the OPC. There's the EPC. There's the CCCP, which is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, <laughs> which is not you. And so— Well, and people always get us confused with Pentecostals because they both start with a P, and I don't. that doesn't make any sense to me, but that's I hear it all the time. Now, Mike, you actually— Started out Jehovah's Witness, got saved. That's right. Baptized by immersion in a Baptist church. Sure was. Thank and, God you're going to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fact, it was one of your deacons, I believe, that actually uh, took me to church in high school um, after I left. Uh, Ryan England uh, became a good friend of mine and invited yeah. me to church and got me around the Word and uh, developed some good friendships. Yes, and and then somewhere along the way, you lost your moorings. You became a Presbyterian. And all all things are. happen in college, right? I'm going to blame that one on college. There you so. go. No, but you have a great church, and what I love about your church, you were a plant of, the, like you said, the Mother Church in Olive Branch, but you guys are trying to reach, is it fair to say, a hard area of DeSoto County? Well, uh, we, we intentionally planted in Horn Lake because it's different um, and because there uh, wasn't a lot of emphasis on church planting in Horn Lake at the time. It's, a, it's kind of a blue-collar community, very diverse community. Um, it's not a typical target community of Presbyterian churches. Um, you know, we tend to be kind of uh, um, a little Ole Miss, you know, <laughs> a little— uh, Yeah, little, I used to joke with you way back when you were at Olive Branch, I don't have enough money to be a PCA pastor. <laughs> I'm not wealthy enough to be a PCA pastor, and you'd always laugh. We're not like that. So you really broke the mold going to Horn Lake. In some ways, yeah. I'm sure that, you know, there are plenty of types of PCA churches, but, uh, yeah, ours is a little different. Uh, we're bilingual. 
Uh, we have a pretty sizable number of Hispanic immigrants in our church. Um, uh, we have people from all walks of life, uh, a lot of different backgrounds. So, And I love it. I love what I see. I've got to come visit one one Sunday when I have time off. And, yeah, let's do a pulpit and, swap sometime. Yeah, let's do a pulpit swap. You'll say all kinds of heresy. I'll say all kinds of <laughs> heresy. And yeah, it'll just, I promise I won't preach on baptism. There you go. So Mike's at uh, the church there in Horn Lake. And then Jonathan Gitwell Church. Um, do you mind just giving a brief little history? I know sure. there's some, some sensitive stuff, but you guys started out Methodist. We started out United Methodist, and we were planted here to reach people that were not being reached uh, any other way. Uh, I do think that's important for us to remember uh, that every church has a different culture that connects with different kinds of people. And so we are all needed uh, for the collective work of sharing the gospel. We were planted in uh, the mid 80s and uh, through a, a couple of different pastors that led there, uh, they continue to thrive. And then in uh, 2000, uh, a pastor came, my predecessor, uh, Pastor Bill Beavers came, and the church really began to explode, uh, not just with numerical growth, but with just a, a depth of maturity for the gospel, for discipleship, uh, for personal growth in this commitment to follow Jesus. Uh, they made some decisions to change their worship style from a more conservative to, I guess, what you'd call a more contemporary uh, style of worship, and it began to grow even more. Uh, and as we were more and more committed to the, this mission of sharing the gospel, we really were struggling with some of the, the I would say, back burner issues of the denomination that were being pushed to the forefront that we saw really as a distraction from the main call to be sharing the gospel and growing people in the word. And, and we really decided for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one is we needed to stand on the authority of God's word. And some of our uh, brothers and sisters in the denomination, we felt like we're slipping away from that. And another is that we felt like we needed to stand on strong leadership. And there was some question a around what that looked like. And we just did not want to be distracted anymore from the main thing. And so in 2016, we began that process of, uh, of removing ourselves from that connection so that we could focus on the authority of God's word, the mission before us to develop strong leaders for the mission of, of sharing the gospel and growing people in the faith. And, and we are, are continued to be committed to that. Uh, those really are heartbeat. We want to not only share the gospel, but we want to grow people in the gospel. I think sometimes we forget that it's it's a whole package deal. You don't just tell somebody about Jesus, but you show them how to follow him and how to be a disciple. And then you help them to understand uh, their calling in life. And one of the things that we really focus on a lot, we love to ask people three questions. We ask them, number one, what breaks your heart? What is it that thing that you say, somebody ought to do something about that? And the second question we ask is, well, what do you have to work with? Your time, your money, your talents, your, your giftedness, your experiences, your education. And the third question is, what, do you, what are the needs around you? And we believe when you find the intersection of those three questions, you get sent out with this purpose that's rooted in the call of Jesus and so we, we try to live out this holistic calling of telling people about Jesus, then showing him what it looks like to follow him, and then living out your calling to go out there and do it. Uh, so that's, that's kind of our DNA of, of who we are um, and, and love to see just what God continues to do. Yeah, Mike was writing all that down. He was like new mission statement for Christ <laughs> Covenant Fellowship Covenant That's, Church. It was very well spoken. PCA. Yes, uh, I've heard it. Jonathan has it down. You got it down. He's that's great. So, so you guys, you know, you have these awesome churches that they're we're all different in numerical size. Our churches are. We're all different denominationally. You were former Methodist, now non-denominational. You guys chose to step out of that, but. What unites us pastorally and even the mission of our churches? Let's talk about that benefit for just a moment. 
we are all united around the authority and sufficiency of Scripture, God's holy word. It is authoritative. It is sufficient. And you guys are shaking your head. Yep. We're all united around Christ is the Redeemer, salvation. It is through uh, faith alone, uh, grace alone, uh, Christ alone, uh, all the solas, mm-hmm. right? Uh, it's, it's united around those truths. Um, Jesus Christ is the author of our salvation. Well, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, in that process. And, and we share these doctrinal agreements that unite us. And I don't want to say right. them all. You could probably add to that. One thing here I think is very important for people to understand is that just because we share a role as pastor, it doesn't mean that we have thrown out discernment Mm -hmm. and who we enter into friendship with. We have enough in common, not only doctrinally, I think it has to start there, the authority of Scripture saved uh, by grace through faith through the work of jesus alone Uh, we share a a similar passion for people to to step into discipleship and become followers of jesus uh, to live missionally there's enough there that we can build on Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that if we had significant differences we would just throw caution to the wind for the sake of connecting with another pastor that's super important for us to remember and I think that one of the things that our churches benefit from is because we have enough similarities in what our focus and our foundation is, is that we can then share ideas with one another. We can share things that have worked and things that haven't worked, and we can share things that we're thinking about, what God's put on our heart. Of course, filtering that through the cultures of our own congregation, but allowing that to expand our holy imagination for what God could and might do through the ministries that we have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's clear to me that all three of us are committed to the Great Commission. Um, we might utilize a different methodology in how we approach that. And as you said, and I completely agree with you, that the church cultures are all different. Every local church culture uh, is unique. Um, and that's a beautiful thing in a lot of ways to me because God uh, blesses and uses churches that are different to reach different people in different situations. And so um, I lean into that. I think that's an important uh, reality, and um, I think we can learn from each other. Mm-hmm. One of my professors in my doctoral program, one of your PCA guys, Phil, I'm trying to remember his last name, he wrote a book, Every Church Has a Personality. Mm -hmm. And it's true. Every church has a culture, as you guys are saying. Our cultures are different. Our church personalities are different. But yet we we have these agreements in the gospel, and and we agree with you, Jonathan. Yeah, we we haven't thrown discernment to the wind. There's some pastors in our own denominations we wouldn't associate with. I, I don't know of any off the top of my head. I'm not implicating anybody. I'm just saying that as a general statement. We would say, yeah, n- nice guy, but, you know, I don't know that he's on the same track with the gospel, with the preaching of the word that I am, even though he has Baptist in his name. What does that mean? I mean, you know, Mike, you said there's a ton of Presbyterian churches and they're all different. There's a ton of Baptist. I mean, you got fundamental Baptists that say, you know, if you don't, if you have alien immersion, and you don't follow the trail of blood, and you don't use the King James Version of the Bible, you're going to hell. And they stand on that. I, I really wouldn't want to associate with, with, with that particular brother necessarily. Not that I wouldn't, but there's going to be a lot of disagreement. So we don't throw discernment to the wind, but we have enough in common. Now, I would also say, the elephant in the room, of course there's things we disagree on as well, Right. Yes, absolutely. Yes, um, but I think I can say in good conscience that, you know, if my children didn't end up in a PCA church but ended up in one of your churches, it would not disappoint me in the least. Um, what I am trying to teach them is, um, is the Word being taught faithfully, 
in this church and do the people in this church seem to, to love each other? And do they care about the Great Commission? Those are the things that matter the most to me. Yeah, I always remember my first day of seminary, the dean of the seminary, he got up to you know, prepare us for what we were about to enter into. And I'll never forget, he said, I'm very confident that 80% of my theology is correct. The only problem is I just don't know which 80%. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And he yeah. reminded us to, that we take a stance on our theological perspective and, and what we believe God has revealed to us in Scripture, but we have to take that stance, he said, on our knees, meaning in prayer and with humility. And I think that is so true. And I just try to remind, uh, starting with my family, but our congregation as well, is we're going to wrestle through the revelation of God. We're going to wrestle with Scripture, we, and we should do that, and we should do it in prayer and in community with humility, built on the people who have come before us, and, and we're going to at times come to different conclusions. We just have to make sure that we're rooting it in Scripture and we're rooting it in prayer, and it's not opinion. It's not what somebody wrote in a book, but what is it that the Word of God instructs us to believe and how it instructs us to live and making sure that we're rooting ourselves in that. That is what, to me, becomes so very important. And I believe when you are doing that, you tend to find more similarities than differences and certainly the most important elements of the gospel. You find yourself on the same foundation. Mm -hmm. Jesus was uh, full of truth and full of grace. 100% 100% of both, and we have to learn to hold on to both of those things. Yeah, well, and you mentioned something you tell your kids, Mike. Find a church, the second thing, that where they love one another. And then, Jonathan, I'm just kind of pulling together mm-hmm. what you're saying. You, you're saying, you know, yeah, we've, we've got to, you know, practice these things that we believe, but we've got to be loving in the way that we do it. We have disagreements We understand that, but it doesn't mean we can't love each other as brothers. In the culture in which we're living right now, there is such a vitriol over everything. I mean, we know it's political. You're either on my side or you're not. But even in the in the realms of theology, my goodness, in the last four years, I have witnessed this just demand that everybody get on board with where I am. And if you don't, then you're not invited back to my conference to speak, even though we've been friends for 30 years. Um, you know, we're not going to be on a panel together. And then you, you see all these keyboard warriors out there who have gotten a seminary degree and they want to, they just want to pounce. They're ready to argue. They want to have a podcast. They want to prove a point. There's so much of that. I think it benefits our church to see unity among the brothers, even if we have theological disagreements in particular areas, we have enough agreement on the majors. I used to have a professor in seminary, Kendall Easley, a New Testament Greek professor at Mid-America, and he would always tell us, major on the majors and minor on the minors, and you know, he would quote that church father, and I can't remember, maybe it was Athanasius who said, you know, um, in, what is it, uh, in something, fidelity oh, yeah, and unity and charity and charity yeah. and in this, and he would say, so, so operate that way. You know, you can't get, Augustine, you can't get Baptists to agree on everything. We've got Baptists in this church that disagree on various positions within Scripture. Spurgeon said, if you line 10 Baptists up, it would be like lining an old clock, 10 old clocks up. You wind them all up at the same time, and they're still not all going to tick perfectly together. And that's the way it would be with Baptists. If you lined them up, they're not all going to tick perfectly together. They're going to find disagreements. There's gonna, somebody's going to be off. That's just that's natural. Right. And, you know, I, I don't know about you guys. Uh, to be honest with you, I just don't have a lot of energy to spend arguing with people. Mm -mm. I I know I have a pretty good sense of clarity on what God has called me to do and how he's called me to do it. I would assume the same for you guys. You have some clarity 
around what you're supposed to be doing and how you're supposed to be doing it. And we all have to be faithful to Christ and his call upon us and set our energy on doing that. It's, it's not productive for us to spend time arguing with one another about the ancillaries, about things that are, are the minors. We should be encouraging one another to be faithful to what God has set before us. And I don't want to just say it. I think one of the things that we need to understand as pastors is it's not just what we say, it's what we model. And we're modeling for the people that we are connected to and get to pastor and get to lead and get to teach that we need to build unity with one another for the mission. In so many ways, it's a picture of heaven, of what we're going to experience when we stand before God based on his grace, that we are joined together, all these different expressions and and different ways that we look and different places we've come from and different cultures that we've experienced but we're all in the same place because of what Jesus has done for us. Not what a denomination did for us or, you know, our roots did for us, but what Jesus has done for us. And we get to model that. Our culture is obsessed with building boundaries and building fences and getting offended. It is so easy to be offended today. It's almost become a spiritual discipline to not get offended. You know, I try to remind our leaders that we have to have a thick skin and a soft heart, that we protect ourselves from easily being offended, but we continue to have compassion for one another. And we get to model that, this practice of building bridges with one another. Again, not throwing discernment out the window, but living out the, the call that Jesus said, you know, the way that you, you'll be known by the world that you follow me is the way you love each other. Or the greatest commandment, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Sometimes I think we let doctrine prevent us from living out the greatest commandment, which is to love one another. And of course, what we believe matters because that leads to decisions and that leads to actions and that leads to habits and that leads to the direction of your life. And so we take that seriously. But to do with that without love, as Paul reminds us, it throws it all out the window. Mm -hmm. I often refer to Mark 9 um, when this topic comes up where Jesus you know, his disciples encounter a man who's casting out demons, but he's not with them. And they get sideways about it. Hey, should we tell this guy to stop? And Jesus is like, no, whoever's not against me is for me, right? And so it, 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 I think that's the, uh, the same thing applies in this situation. You know, we, we may not be in the exact same circle, but I don't think when he prayed in John 17 that we have unity, that he was thinking only about our denominational circles. Well, and Paul says it in Philippians uh, chapter 1, I think. He says, you know, some preach Christ out of rivalry and vain conceit, but whatever their motive, I'm just thankful that Christ is preached. Mm-hmm. That has been one of the most perplexing verses of Scripture to me over the course of years, because that's not what you often hear other pastors say. You know, there are the keyboard warriors, and I, I agree. I'm, I don't have the time. I'm busy, and it would exhaust me to argue. And I've known pastors that were just honest about it. One in particular, and, and he's, he's recognizable now, but I knew him before that, and we had lunch once, and he said, you know, I want to do whatever it takes to get basically famous, well-known. And he said, so I'm going to attack this issue, and I'm going to attack this issue, and whichever one gets me the traction, and he did, and and it worked. And, you know. We've got those guys, too, and to be honest with you, most of them are in tiny churches that are making no impact in their community because they spend all their time in their office writing articles and commenting, and it's very frustrating. Yeah. So our churches also benefit from our relationship in ways they don't even know. Some of your, some of the ideas that we get, I mean, I bounce ideas. What do you guys think about this? Hey, can you help me with this particular issue? What would you do? We've certainly done that. It's always been helpful to me. You know, I don't know that we've all done that, but our churches benefit. They don't even know. Our relationship just breeds discussion about ministry, about work, about what God's called us to do. So, yeah, any, any thoughts on that? Uh, I think I probably joked with you about this before, but uh, 
I like to say that Baptists make the best Presbyterians. Probably works the other way around too. So if you ever get any Presbyterians, they'd probably make pretty good Baptists. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Not only sharing ideas, but building character. I think that that's kind of a hidden element here that we are building one another's character and I would say if you have performance and character at odds with one another, character always wins. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we focus more on performance, but really character always wins. And so, yes, we share ideas and we throw things off of one another. We help people think through uh, things. We help each other problem solve. But I think this element of building one another up as men of God makes us better preachers, makes us better pastors, makes us better leaders, where we avoid landmines just because we encourage each other to keep our eyes on Jesus rather than a strategy or a program as primary. And I think that our churches are absolutely benefiting from that in these invisible ways that I'm not really even sure that we can quantify or measure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned something earlier, Jonathan, and it's so true when I talk with you guys, whether you realize it or not, your friendship makes me feel less crazy. Yeah. And that's that's biblical. There's there's a book where the author says that about the friendship of Jesus and how friends make you realize, hey, I'm more normal than I thought. And people who don't have that kind of relationship with other people, they can't bounce those ideas off. They often think, well, I'm the only one struggling with this type of parenting issue or I'm the only one struggling with this church issue. I know just recently in the concession stand, Jonathan, and I, I didn't share this with you over French fries, but I'll share it to you now that, that we're all alone and nobody's listening. But, uh, you know, Jonathan said several things to me um, just in our discussions in the concession stand. And, Jonathan, I went home, and in my journal I wrote those down and wrote, man, I was so encouraged. I, I feel like I'm not crazy you know, he, he's saying some of the same things that I'm dealing with and I'm struggling with. And he's telling me, you know, you were telling me, and I don't want to get too personal, but just how you came and it was rough at first. And you were saying, hey, you, you kept telling me you're still getting your footing. You know, you mm -hmm. haven't been here five years. You're still getting your footing. And I mean, I knew that, but it was so good to hear another pastor say, you'll get your footing. And, you know, you got, you're going to make it through this. And Mike, you've shared with me before family. And I think, well, you know, Mike's not crazy and our family is crazy too, but we're all, I guess we're all normal, right? I mean, look at his family, look at our family, we're going to make it. So it's so encouraging. And I, I don't think churches realize that aspect of it, but that friendship bleeds over and you're right. We probably can't, can't quantify it. But our churches benefit because we are bouncing ideas off. There have been times I've told you, hey, this member's coming over to your church, um, or you've told me, or whatever the case may be. And, you know, we have a, f a fellowship. Wouldn't it be sad if we didn't pick up the phone and here we are right down the street from each other and just did it? But there's a lot, that happens a lot. I'm getting to know more and more pastors in our area. But I've also discovered a lot. Some pastors don't want to get together. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll go to a breakfast that the denomination puts on, but they don't really want to open up and fellowship. I've tried with some, and you know, it was kind of like, oh well, you know, I'm I'm much too busy for that, you know, or whatever the case may be. So I appreciate that your hands are open to me, and that you're saying, look, I'll be your friend. Right. I think I hope the number one thing that I can offer to you guys and what you offer to me is to know that I'm not crazy and that I'm not alone. And most importantly, to not give up. Don't give up. Don't lose your focus. Keep your eyes on faithfully following Jesus and what he's called you to do. And I think we were, are naive if we don't realize that we need to hear that message from one another on a regular basis. Mm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Mike, you're the most sane one of all of us. <laughs> if you only knew. I'm just kidding. I do know. <laughs> okay. Oh, gosh. Well, that's, that's fantastic. So our churches benefit. Let's move to the third thing, our communities. 
benefit. Here in this Christian South, post-Christian culture America, I think it's good that they see three pastors from three different churches. That's a feat in and of itself. Among Baptists, the joke is we have the Southern Baptist Convention, we have the cooperative program, but it's really the competitive program. Hmm. Now, I'm not saying that's the way Southern Baptists are here locally, but you know, there's an effort to try to work together. But there, there does seem to be that sometimes. We're in competition with you. We're not in cooperation with you. And you know, I love the fact that um, I don't feel that with you guys. I don't feel the competitiveness. I don't. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I certainly, <laughs> you know, I, I can't say how I might have thought about these things or talked about them in my 20s, but the older I get, the less competitive I am. I, I don't, I no longer see my role as collecting people, you know, for my own glory. Um, and I think that's the temptation for a lot of pastors as ministry is about numbers. Um, and that's not been the case for me for a long time. And I, I think it's, it's so important for us to realize, and maybe you don't learn this right away. Maybe it takes some time for this to sink in. And I think this translates to any area of life is when we focus on what we can do and our strategy and, and trying to make things happen, let's say church growth or growing your business or whatever it might be. That is so much of a lower ceiling than if we just kind of open our hands to what God wants to do, focus on prayer, focus on the movement of the Holy Spirit, let God do what God wants to do. And so the context of competition, when you see it that way, doesn't even make sense because God is moving in the way that God wants to move. And as we surrender to the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do in each of our collective congregations, it, it it's only adding to the same sum. Mm -hmm. We're not competing with one another. We're heading in, in the same direction. We have the same prize. We have the same goal. We have the same win. And there's a subtle shift that I think if we can make as pastors and as congregations that we are not serving a physical address. We're serving a community. That begins to change our mindset. It begins to change our attitude. I think it's a, a more liberating way to live. It takes the pressure off that I'm not trying to succeed. I'm just being faithful. And that there are going to be times where somebody is a cultural fit for one of your congregations. And, and I want them to be in that place where they fit and can thrive and can grow and can use their gifts for the kingdom of God. There are going to be times where somebody is a better fit in the culture of Get Well Church. And so we have open arms and we want to grow them as they follow Jesus and then know what they're called to do and live it out. Paul talks about the body of Christ. He wasn't just talking about uh, one gathering of people or another. He's talking about the whole that we together, including different churches on different addresses, are the body of Christ. We need one another. If we're going to reach this community, there are so many people just in DeSoto County. And it's growing every and day. Growing. We, yeah. There's no possible way that in, any one of us could reach all the people who don't know or don't follow Jesus. We absolutely need one another for the mission. That's right. And less than a third of DeSoto County residents now attend church regularly in the Bible Belt, right? So right. I'm rooting for any Bible-believing church <laughs> to flourish, to grow, to reach people. And I feel like this is a good time to make a plug for church planting. We've talked a lot about church culture and how each ch uh, church culture is different. And you guys know as well as I do that the longer a church is established, that cement dries really quickly on what the church culture is going to be in that body. And that's why I think it's so important for us to plant new churches, um, because we have the opportunity to have wet cement and to reach, you know, the new generations that are coming up to establish new leadership in those churches, uh, where a lot of times in our established churches, you got the same people leading for 20, 30, 40 years, and le new leaders aren't being trained. And so I think church planting allows us to do that. Uh, and I'm pretty sure both of you guys are committed to to that yeah. as well. Yeah, I, I would love for Broadway. We're supporting two local church planters, great guys. I mean, love them dearly, excited about what they're going to do. But I would love the day where Broadway directly, and we're getting there, where we're sending out a planter and a team. 
what concerns me, and this is what I love about what you've done, Mike, you went to an area. You know, I grew up in Horn Lake, mm-hmm. went to Horn Lake High School. You know, that's home for me. But everybody, you know, that was once there, that that culture has changed. And people aren't thinking about Horn Lake, but I love that you did and you went there. And often when people talk about church planting, you know, I went to a seminar and all these people in DeSoto County were there and they were talking about what they were going to do and what they were going to church plant. And I, I said, OK, but it sounds like you're going only south, which is where all the wealthier um, upper class people are moving, mm. whether that's Senatobia, Hernando, whatever. I said, it sounds like you're only planting south. Is anybody planning to go north? where this massive city is hmm. that needs the gospel and the answer was well no we're right, we're not really doing anything north yeah. everything we're doing is south and that's easy to me because I mean, of course that's where the people are going to move but what about this the inner city and and you know we were talking about this Jonathan just at the concession stand we were talking about how you know we need a presence here and you were saying Gitwell has a, a branch in Hernando that was given to you. Right. Neat story. I wish somebody would give Mike and I a church. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're at a strip center. So yeah, if you know so of anything in the that, Horn Lake area. Anybody that wants to give you a building, yeah. <laughs> um, pray about that, somebody. But a- anyway, you know, we were talking about this, and you said, Jonathan, no matter what, we're always going to have a presence because that's so important in this area. We can't all just leave. We've got to stay, you know, we've got to have a presence and then plant elsewhere. So, yeah. Yeah, the local church in so many ways becomes a healthy lifeblood of the community that they we are a light in, in, a, in a dark world. And when we take the easy path to go to more comfortable locations and more comfortable communities, it's almost like we are giving up on that community. And I, I think that G- Jesus is calling us to do the hard things. I'm committed that if you want to see the miracles of God and you want to see where God's at work, is you go to the hard places and you get involved in the hard things because Jesus is about changing lives and he's about redeeming people and he's about you know being close to the brokenhearted. And when we can commit ourselves like go into Horn Lake or – you know, staying planted where you are and, and not forgetting the initial calling that God's put on you and, and put the results aside. Yes, we want to focus on results. We, we want to have things that we can measure. But just focusing first on faithfulness. What is it you've already told me to do? We worry so much about what's the next thing. Well, why don't we focus on what's the first thing? All right? And when I am faithful to that, then God will give me the next thing. So let me just be faithful to this until you tell me the next thing, and, and I'm going to stay planted here and continue to be faithful. And whatever the result is, that's what the result will be. And when we, we start to focus on that, being faithful, loving people, not making people a, a notch on our belt that I'm going to grow my ministry, but just saying I'm going to love you as Christ would love you and, and let God do the work that God's going to do, there's this amazing thing that happens. I think people can see when we have ulterior no- motives, but when we just love people for where they, where they are, and I think that's part of the benefit of this, is spurring one another on toward that kind of living, that we lead our churches to love people. Yes, we share the gospel, but we understand that it's the Holy Spirit that brings life change, and we just focus on faithfully loving our community and there are going to be times where it's not just encouragement, but we might join together and we might put our resources together and we might share ideas. We might share needs. There are some needs in the community that I'll learn from you guys. And there's some community needs that you'll learn from me that, that maybe you're better suited to meet that need than my congregation. And so I want to be able to go to you and say, here's a need that we're not we don't have the resources to meet very well, but I can see that you do. And so let's take our focus off of an address and put it on the community and figure out how we serve these people together. Mm-hmm. We were talking pre-show as well, how post-Christian society urges us to work together. 
back in the 1920s. So I, I grew up in a denomination that came from the Southern Baptist. Then they branched off in the 1920s, ABA, Bogard, because of some disagreement at the national meeting. Then from the ABA in 1952, they branched off again to the BMA because of representation at the national meeting. You had to have messengers physically present. No, we want people to be able to submit a letter to the national meeting. And so this became the big issue. It was never theological. It was never missional. It was basically these minute political governing bureaucratic issues. But the church could, if you will forgive me, afford that in the 1920s and 1950s because they were in a predominantly Christian culture where, yeah, little things like that were big. And so you could argue with the Southern Baptist down the street and say, you're not a believer because you didn't come from a trail of blood church like me, a landmark church. But what we're seeing now is quite the opposite. Those landmark churches are all dying out. You know, people are over 60 in those churches. The pews are half empty. Churches are saying, okay, now our culture has completely changed. You just mentioned two-thirds of DeSoto County is not in church. So suddenly those minor things that divided us no longer matter, and we find ourselves coming together for the sake of the gospel. And people are watching. People are watching not only what we do, but how we do it. And do we have this agenda to build up a number of people who gather in our space so we can feel better about ourselves and have a bigger kingdom for ourselves? Or do we truly love them? Are we committed to serving them? Are we pointing them toward the kingdom of God? And people notice more than we realize what our focus is, what our motive is, what our agenda is. And I think there's this spiritual dynamic when we put the focus on Jesus and on the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, there is so much more uh, numbers growth, but, but so more importantly, uh, spiritual growth, th this growth that only the Holy Spirit can bring because our motives are in the right place to serve God, not to serve ourselves. And so it's not just a practical or strategic issue about serving the community. It's opening our hearts to the movement and the work of God. And God, the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but he blesses and favors the humble. And I think that we've got to keep that in mind, that our, our motive is to humbly serve our community. And then God blesses those efforts. You know, it's easy to look at the decline uh, in church attendance and, you know, numbers of professing Christians and, and be discouraged by it. But a positive spin on that is that the church has actually gotten much leaner and healthier. I mean, one of the reasons we found each other is because, you know, it's easier to find like-minded brothers uh, across denominations because we've lost a lot of the dead weight of people that were just doing it uh, for you know, poor reasons, poor motivations, and a lot of the people that were coming to church for poor reasons have quit coming. And so the ones that are left are committed and love Jesus and are trying to uh, live out the gospel. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot to be uh, optimistic about um, that with the new state of affairs that we actually uh, maybe have a shot at reaching some of these folks. Yeah, and when we start to feel discouraged, I, isn't it good to remember the promise that Jesus gave that not even the gates of hell are going to prevail against his church and it is his church amen amen well I'm thankful to have you as friends brothers and I'm thankful to serve with you in the sake of the gospel and I, I look forward to what the Lord will do in our lives hey I know let's start a conference We'll call it Together for the Gospel. <laughs> Nobody's ever done that before. What do you think? I'm going to pray about that. Yeah, that's that's what I say. That's yeah. exactly what I'm going to pray about that. Let's go discuss at a bar. Okay, all right. <laughs> we walk into a bar, and what happens? We form a committee. Well, Jonathan Wallace of Get Well, uh, Mike Weinbrenner of Christ Fellowship, I'm so thankful for you guys. Thank you that you came on this podcast. Let's do this again. Absolutely. Sounds right. good. 
And that's Footnotes. Footnotes.